I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody About somebody Who can save anybody God, yes, well, both for those mountains and for those valleys. Yes. And we're going to understand why we thank you for those valleys in just a few moments. But Lord God, be with us, Father. Help us to get through this year in a way that we would seek to glorify and get closer to you than we ever have been in our lives. And we give you all the glory and honor and praise in the Christ Jesus name. And everyone greet and say, so blessed, I don't even know where to begin. I do. First of all, it's good to be back as family. Uh, because I think this is my third or fourth time here. And so, brother, your next time is family, too. Amen. And, and let me tell you, since I've been here a couple of times and I've had the opportunity to be family here, let me share with you what, it, what, it, what it's like. Oh, it's Thank great. Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's absolutely great. So, so you know, I, 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 what time does the service usually end? We're guarding you. Amen. Good. So, so, you know, Pastor said, as long as I get you out of here before 5 o'clock, you know, it's fine. Um, all right, a couple of things to share with you. First of all, uh, last month, uh, uh, by the way, Sandy and I, my wife and I, have, have three children. They're not children anymore. They're all adults. I mean, the youngest one is like 25. And... And, and so, last month, our oldest son got married, and thank you, and this month, next week, our youngest daughter is getting married, and, and, and next month, we're broke, but, but it's okay. Our faith, our faith comes with the Lord, and the interesting thing about it is that, that next Sunday, now, next Sunday, it's our youngest daughter who's getting married, and you'll appreciate this. First of all, how many of you have been uh, uh, partnering with Jewish Voice Ministries and Rabbi Jonathan Burnus? Many of you in here, we, we so appreciate that. And I'm the staff evangelist for, for Jewish Voice Ministries with Rabbi Jonathan Burnus. Next week is going to be interesting because my daughter said, she said, Dad, would you please officiate the wedding for me? Amen. Amen. I'd be delighted. And she said, Dad, I need you to do something else. I said, what? She said, would you also walk me down the aisle? <laughs> I said, I'm going to do that too. I don't know how, because for those of you who have ever been to a wedding, see, the bride goes up last, and the officiant goes up first. <laughs> so I'm trying to think how I could then go up first, you know, because the officiant's supposed to be standing there very respectfully, you know, watching the rest of the procession. And I'm trying to figure out how when the procession's coming up, I Anybody look at, all right, you know, I'm kind of running off and, and, and go to the back of the procession again to be with my daughter. But, but, starting off as efficient uh, for my daughter's wedding, and I'll take over a few minutes later, is, is Rabbi Jonathan Burnett from Jewish Voice Ministry. So it's a wonderful, wonderful collection. Amen. So that's what's coming up next week. That song about blessing him and praising him in the mountains and the valleys so blessed me personally. And how many of you know it's not just a song? Come on, amen. And, and how many of you know it's real? I want to give you a little bit of encouragement before we get into the message today. Because it's true. It's easy to praise him when things are going great. And it's tough to praise him when things are not. And when we're in those valleys, how many times have we said, Lord, I don't understand what's going on. Why does this have to happen? And I'm going to give you a short answer, and I'm going to give you a longer answer. And even though this is not part of the message, if you remember anything from my being here today, Please remember this story. It's very important. And it'll help you not only get through 2016, but for the rest of your life and for eternal life. Amen. So listen to this story. 
It goes something like this, because when, when, when we have these times and valleys, we say, Lord, I don't understand it. Why am I going through this? What's going on? The short answer is that God has a plan for you that goes way beyond that valley. But sometimes he needs to take you through the valley so that you could see what the result of his plan will be. That's the short answer. Let me give you the longer answer. Great story. It's a story about a man who was working a 9 to 5 job Monday through Friday. It's not me, my 9 to 5 Monday through Friday. And one Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock, he was just absolutely exhausted. Now, every Friday afternoon, his friend would come to pick him up and give him a lift home because he didn't have a car. And so on this particular Friday, it was a long week, a lot of stress on the job. How many of you have had stress in a week that you just said, Lord, I am so glad the week is over. Yeah. Yeah. And so the week was over and his friend came to pick him up and he said to his friend, he said, boy, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. I'm, I'm more tired than I've ever been in a long time and I just can't wait to get home. And the friend said it. He said, well, that's, you know, that's nice, and, uh, uh, and, and I know you want to get home, but uh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to take you out for dinner. And the man said, said, well, you know, that's a really nice gesture, and maybe another time, but I'm, I'm tired, and I, I'm just run down. Could you please take me home? And the friend said, well, you know, I wouldn't be a real friend if I didn't treat you to dinner, so let's go to dinner. I insist. And, of course, his friend, who's sitting in the passenger seat, is saying, well, you know, uh, I, I don't know why he's doing this. He's my friend. I, I, I want to go home. Why doesn't he take me home? But I guess he wants to do something nice for me and take me out to dinner. So I'll go and have dinner with him. So they went and had a very nice dinner. And his friend paid for the dinner. And about an hour and 15 minutes later. Now, how many of you know, if you're tired to begin with, the only way to get more tired is to eat something. Isn't that true? So after the man has eaten something, he's even more tired than he was. And he said, all right. Well, you know, after that dinner, I, I'm just really ready for bed now. So, so you, can, you can take me home now. And the friend said, he said, what do you mean take you home? He <laughs> said, well, where, are we going somewhere else? He said, yeah, listen, the newest movie is out. I am going to treat you to the movie. He said, but you don't understand. I, I, I don't want to go to the movie. I'm, I'm beyond tired. I'm beyond exhausted. Now, please just take me home. He said, look, I got two movie passes. They expire tonight. If I don't use them now, they're done. I am taking you to the movies. Now, how many of you know if this was you, you'd probably start getting really mad about this point. Wow. <laughs> Say, what is he doing? He's not even thinking of me. I'm tired. Well, I guess I can just go to the movie and, and you know, keep my eyes closed, maybe fall asleep during the movie. Nobody will see. And, and, and so the man goes to the movie, and this, this is not just like a two-hour movie. This is one of those movies. How many of you know there are a lot of movies as of late that they go like three, four hours? Who said Star Wars? I haven't even seen the darn thing. But this was one of those movies. So it is now, it is now five hours after the man got out from work. So he got out at five, it's now ten o'clock. And he finally said to his friend, and he was angry, he said, now would you please take me home? And the friend said, well, of course I will. Calm down. <laughs> and this man is sitting in the passenger seat and he said, I can't understand why I had to go through all this. All I wanted to do was just go home after work. And he, take, he took me to dinner, took me to the movies. I could you know what? I... I don't think I'm going to be his friend anymore. I just about had it with him. He obviously doesn't care about me. This is one of the worst times I've ever had in my life. I can't believe I had to go through this. So the man drops him off at his house. He says, well, you know, you take care. Have a good weekend. Fine. <laughs> man walks up to his door, takes the key, unlocks it, opens up the door. And on the other side of that door, there's about 50 people saying, surprise, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand the lesson in that? Yeah. <laughs> and at that moment, the man said, Now I understand why my friend couldn't take me home. And the reason that his friend couldn't take him home is because any earlier than that point where the man had taken him home, the people who wanted to come and move around their schedules and get to that man's house to surprise and celebrate him wouldn't be able to do it. This man had the right plan in mind for his friend all along, but his friend got upset because his friend couldn't see it. What if, what if, 
Even in those valleys, those times when you get frustrated, you can say, Lord, I don't understand why I'm going through this. I wish it was this way. Why does it have to be this way? Because maybe, just maybe, God is working out a plan that you won't see until you unlock that door. Amen. Please keep that in mind. And that's why we praise Him, not only in the Family, it's so good to be back here with you again. I, I want to get into it, to the message, into the teaching now today, uh, which hopefully we'll be able to put on the screen in, uh, in, in just about a minute or so. And uh, let me just say how, how wonderful and how awesome it is once again to be here with you in the house yeah. of the Lord. Somebody was asking me, they said, so Rabbi, you know, what, what did you do this past year? Did, did you do any traveling? And brother, you asked me that. And, and while we're waiting for this, one of the places that I went was Johannesburg, South Africa, where a pastor was actually supposed to meet me at the airport there. And he said, I will meet you at the airport and I'll take you to the church because I had the opportunity to preach. Well, our schedules got a little bit mixed up, and he said, he said, Rabbi, uh, 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 I wasn't able to get there. Something happened. I said, Pastor, don't worry about it. I will rent a car, and I will drive to your church. I've never been to South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, they had like a budget rent-a-car thing, and so I went, and they said, okay, driver's license, fine. I said, great. And they gave me the keys, and I go out to the parking lot, and I open up the door, and I'm saying, oh, there's no steering wheel here. <laughs> oh, there it is. On the passenger side of the car. And I said, Lord, I've never done this before. Now, brother, you said you lived in London for 17 years back in the 1950s. So they were driving on what we call the wrong side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I said, all right, I, I, I got in. I said, all right, got in the car and, and I'm on the other side. And just make sure that there's, make believe there's like an invisible other side there too. And, 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 and oh, it's a stick. <laughs> which I learned how to drive and I said alright Lord I know I can do this and I started you know, pulling out of the airport and driving on the highway and I'm realizing oh everybody drives on the other side too how many of you know I had to learn how to drive again really really quick but, but God is so so very good all the time Amen. 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 praise the Lord my message this morning my teaching this morning is called Israel ISIS and the world. Last year when I was here, for those of you who came last year, I think it was last year, about eight, nine months ago, I taught on understanding the Middle East crisis. Because we as believers, obviously here, this is a church that supports Israel. This is a church that blesses yeah. Israel. Yeah. We are folks who bless Israel. But what I wanted to let you know, obviously, and the reason that I did that last year is because I wanted to let you know why we bless Israel. And this morning I'm going to do that a little bit too, but I'm also going to let you know what is going on in Israel and the world. Some of these things you have heard about, some of these things the media isn't telling you so that you can get a better idea of what's going on in the Holy Land and what to pray for. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's go on to our next slide now for Israel, ISIS, and the world. And let's answer a couple of basic questions because as I'm here today, I see a lot of friends that I saw last year. But uh, um, last time when I was here, uh, wait, let me rephrase that. For how many of you, you're meeting me for the first time and I'm meeting you for the first time? Raise your hand. We got quite a few people in here. Oh, okay, then, you know what, Can I, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes and give you a real short testimony. I'm a rabbi who believes in Christ. Good, that'll do it. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> I said, well, you've got to tell us more than that. How'd that happen? Yeah. It happened because about 28 years ago, I married a Christian woman who knew my Bible, and I did not. And she said, I want to tell you about who your Messiah is. And I said, that's fine, you can read any part of the Bible you want as long as it's in the Old Testament. Because I knew we wouldn't go to find Jesus there. <laughs> How many of you know Christ can be found from the first word of Genesis? Amen. 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 And so she shared with me prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about the Messiah. And they all point to Jesus in the Old Testament. It says that the Messiah would be crucified, born of a virgin, suffer and die for the sins of the people, be born in Bethlehem have to come before the second temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. 
And that all points to Christ. And so here I am today. And God is so good. Amen. 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 Why should we care about what happens in Israel? Let's give you some biblical reasons. Let's go on to our next slide. First of all, uh, one of the reasons that a lot of people think we shouldn't care about Israel is because, you know, it's this little, tiny, small nation. The only state in our country that's comparable in size to it is the state of New Jersey. And Israel is even smaller than New Jersey. Anybody here from New Jersey? Do you know what it is? Nobody here from New Jersey because it's so small. No, anyway, let me go ahead. So Israel, 8,367 square miles. New Jersey, 8,722. Population of Israel, 8 million. Population of, of New Jersey, 9 million. New Jersey is never in the news. <laughs> Israel, which is even smaller in size and smaller in population, and on the other side of the world, is in the news every single day. Amen. That should tell us something. It should make even unbeliever ask the question of why? What is it about this tiny little piece of land that when you try and look for it on a globe, you can't find it? You need a magnifying glass on top of reading glasses. What is it with this particular land? And it's because, my friends, while God has his hand on all of us, God has a special hand on Israel. It is his holy land. It is the place where Jesus is going to be coming back to. Let's go on. Why should we care about Israel? By the way, this is good note-taking stuff this morning. I'm just going to let you know. So if you are normally someone who comes to Faith for Life ready to take notes, I will tell you that this is your morning. Amen. And if you are someone who comes to Faith for Life and you don't normally take notes, I will tell you that this is the morning of your repentance. You're going to want to get this stuff down and take some notes. Why bless Israel? Because God says that he will bless you if you will bless Israel. Now that should not be our motivation to do it. You understand me? Uh, it should not be like we should say, well, you know, I really don't care anything about Israel. I don't care. Well, God's going to bless you. Oh, really? Now I care? No, 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 no. That's not it. That's not the reason. We should bless Israel simply because God wants us to. But as a result of our blessing Israel, God said, you know what? Because of your heart and your love, I'm going to bless you too. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Wow. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Why would God want to bless us if we bless Israel? Because, my friends, the best place that you can be in your life is in accordance with God's plan and in His will. Amen. And even before the beginning, God has had a plan for Israel. What, is, what His plan is, He said, you know, I'm going to plant this holy land and holy people, and I'm going to, uh, from this land will come the Savior, the Redeemer. He is going to be born in this land. He is going to ascend from this land. And in my end time plan of salvation for the revival and the renewal of the world, He is going to come back to this land. Amen. Amen. So right all the way, all the way from before the beginning, God said, you know, this land is special to my heart. And so if it's special to God, it should be special to us too. Amen? Amen. And so when we bless Israel, we're acting in accordance with God's will. And that's why he blesses us in return. Why else should we care about Israel? Let's go on to the next slide. Because God calls us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. From Psalm 122, verse 6. The Lord says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for they who love her will prosper. Now let me explain what that word prosper means because in previous years a lot of folks have had the wrong idea of words like prosper and prosperity and thinking it's all about the money and Brother Ron, I am so thankful at the beginning that you said, now don't be playing that lottery. Because <laughs> true prosperity comes in the Lord. Amen. Amen. The way that you prosper by praying for Jerusalem has nothing to do with dollars and cents. Once again, you prosper by praying for the peace of Jerusalem because you're praying in accordance with God's will. It's like you're saying, Lord, I have stepped up right alongside you to be part of that army, and I want to be in your will and in your plan. Amen. 
Now, what's interesting is that there are some folks who said, well, you know, Rabbi Jack, that was written in the Psalms, and that was a long time ago, and so that doesn't apply anymore, so we don't have to do that anymore. How many of you know the Bible says it is the same yesterday, today, and always? Yes, it is. Amen. Which means that if God said something 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, unless he said sometime after that, listen, remember when I said this? Okay, I changed my mind. I don't say that anymore. Unless God says that, it's still the same. Yeah. Still the same. Which, which I find, therefore, I find amazing that scenes like this even take place. This was a, 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 a photo from the, uh, the Presbyterian Church USA. They had their, uh, their annual General Assembly in 2014. Now, the Presbyterian Church has a number of different divisions. There's the PCUSA, Presbyterian Church USA. There's the EPC, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. There's also the PCA, Presbyterian Church of America. They don't all have the same beliefs. PCUSA, however, uh, basically uh, at their assembly, that there was an introdu a, a resolution introduced where they actually considered omitting, taking out the word Israel any time to pray. When the PCUSA said, you know, we, we, we will pray for this person, we will pray for this situation, we will pray for this town, this country, we will pray for anyone and everything and everyone and everything except Israel. Wow. Now thank the Lord it didn't pass, but the fact that this even came up as an idea in the first place is unconscionable. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, it says. Let's go on to our next slide. Why should we as Christians care about Israel? Because folks, that's where God calls home. Amen. It's God's home. You know, I didn't realize this until a couple weeks ago, but in the Bible, God gives us his address. Now, now, if you've been watching Jewish Voice Ministries for, for any length of time, uh, Jonathan Burness oftentimes gives his testimony as, as a Jewish man who, uh, who grew up and who was introduced to Jesus and everybody told him, they said, listen, you need to embrace Jesus. He's your Jewish Messiah. <clears throat> and it was very difficult for him to do that and for me too because when a lot of Jews are interested to Jesus, they, they, they see this kind of like photo or picture or painting or illustration of someone with blonde hair and blue eyes who like has a British accent in every full-length feature film. Yo, that's not Jewish, y'all. I'm just saying. And, 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 uh, and Jonathan Burtis was taught this, and, and he was taught that, that Jesus grew up in the Vatican. And that Jesus' address was one Vatican lane on a mailbox. I'm not making this up. How many of you know we know God's real address? In the Bible, God tells us where he lives. He gives us his address. He says, it says his tent is in Salem. His home is in Zion. Zion is another word for Israel. God is telling you, here's where I live. I live in Israel. Shouldn't we love God enough to respect his home? Amen. When somebody comes to your home, don't you expect that they respect it? Yeah. Does not God deserve the same respect, if not more so? Amen. Israel is his home. Let's go on. Why else should we bless Israel? Because Israel, my friends, is where Jesus is coming back to. Scripture tells us that as well. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 3 through 4, says... Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, when he returns, his feet will stand on Golden Gate Bridge. No. Uh, on Manhattan Island, Statue of Liberty. Uh, Eiffel Tower, Coliseum. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, half the mountain moving north, half the mountain moving south. No wonder, no wonder so many people around the world hate and despise Israel. And if you've thought about it, you probably say, Rabbi, I don't get it, it doesn't make any sense. It's this land, it, it, it's, it's uh, smaller than the size of the state of New Jersey. She's open to everyone who wants to come in and bring peace. 
Uh, she exports wonderful things to the world. All she wants to do is live in peace, not bother anybody. And yet, the whole world, it seems, hates her. Why? This is your answer. Because, my friends, if God loves Israel, and if God is going to come back to Israel, then obviously the enemy, Satan, the devil, has to, has to hate Israel. Has to, he has no choice. And why does the world want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth? Because Satan figures, he said, wait a minute. <laughs> Zechariah just told me where Jesus is coming back to. Okay, he's coming back to Israel. So, okay, so if that's God's plan, and I'm Satan, and I oppose God's plan, then what I got to do is I got to get in the minds of hearts and pollute the minds of hearts and people and tell them to go against Israel and wipe Israel off the face of the earth because if Israel's gone, there's no Israel for Jesus to come back to, says the devil, and I win. Amen. Now you understand. Those people say, well, the world hates Israel. It doesn't make any, doesn't make any logical sense. You're right. It's not supposed to. But it makes 100% spiritual sense if you recognize what the enemy's plan is. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Let's go on. Why support and bless Israel? Because we should love what God loves. Amen. This is profound. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. Now we know that God detests hypocrisy and sin. Amen? Amen? Okay, so how many of you would agree that if God detests hypocrisy and sin, if God hates hypocrisy and sin, we should hate hypocrisy and sin. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Alright, so we're all on the same page. Amen? Amen. Alright. God loves reverence and obedience in Israel. So, if, yeah. if, but look, if for no other reason than the fact that God loves reverence and obedience in Israel, shouldn't we do it too? Amen. Alright, so in Zechariah 2 verse 8, the Lord says, whoever touches you, Israel, whoever messes with you, messes with, touches with the apple of my eye. So Israel is the apple of his eye. So now, f f follow me on this. Here's the rationale. So if we agree to love what God loves, when God says that he loves Israel, why wouldn't Anybody, any believer naturally love Israel and her people. But the fact of the matter is, why do so many agree to love everything that God loves, but all of a sudden when it comes to Israel, well, no, God, that's where you and I got to part company. I mean, think about it. God says, God says, hey, let, let's say you're standing over here. God says, I hate sin. Well, God, if you hate sin, I hate sin too. Good. I hate hypocrisy. Lord, if you hate hypocrisy, I hate hypocrisy. I love obedience and holiness. Lord, if you love obedience and holiness, then I love obedience and holiness. Good. I love Israel. <laughs> you know, God, you were doing really well until you said that. And even those who call them Christians take that kind of attitude. It's regrettable. We should love Israel, not because people have to give us reasons, but the minute God says, I love her, end of argument. Amen. 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 End of argument. Amen. Now let's go on to our next slide. Now, why should we love Israel? Because our enemies, my friends, wipe, want to wipe off the face of the earth. And the time that all of us need the most support is we're under the greatest persecution. Psalm 83, verses 2 through 4. See how your enemies growl, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation <clears throat> so that Israel's name is remembered no more. And, and listen, if you want a list of Israel's enemies... And I'm, I'm glad you're sitting down because it, 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 it would take me a while to go through them all. Yeah. And I'm not even talking recently. Go back to like places like the look of Leviticus and Numbers when Israel wasn't even a nation. You just had the people who would one day become a nation. You remember all those tribes that we had that were just, just wanted to be our enemies. Let's say we had the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Amorites, Agagites. Termites, whoever they happen to be. <laughs> Enemies from long ago. By the way, the only ites left still today are Israelites. I think maybe God is trying to tell us something. Amen. But present day enemies, 
Hamas, Hezbollah, Fatah, uh, Taliban, and of course, on our next slide, these guys, ISIS. And I want to talk a little bit about ISIS because ISIS obviously is an enemy to Israel, but they are also an enemy to us. Amen. We figure, listen, we don't have anything to worry about. We're 8,000 plus miles on the other side of the Middle East. We don't have to worry about any type of ISIS influence here. My God, did you hear what happened most recently in Philadelphia the other day? Where an officer in South Philly was just sitting in his cruiser going about his business and an ISIS-inspired terrorist, and yeah, I'm going to use the word terrorist, got call them what they are, Amen. went up and started shooting at that officer. Now, the officer is in critical condition. They're hoping he's going to be okay. But the man basically said, well, I did it because I pledged my allegiance to ISIS, to Allah. What in the world is going on? Where did this come from? Who is ISIS? Where did they come from? How did they come to power, and why do they kill? I want to give you a little bit of a, a short synopsis, very, very short, of, an, of an answer to those questions, and it's on our next slide. Here are some fast facts for you. ISIS is an acronym that means the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. It was founded in 1999 by a Jordanian by the name of Abu Musa al-Zarqawi. Within five years, ISIS became associated with Al-Qaeda. <laughs> Number two, ISIS over the past couple of years has been led by a man by the name of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He's been the self-appointed head of ISIS now for about five and a half years, since 2010. In 2014, get a load of this, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda, which brought down the World Trade Centers, Al-Qaeda split from ISIS saying, man, listen, we're evil, but you guys are too evil and violent even for us. Imagine that. Yeah. <clears throat> Point number four. ISIS follows, it's called Salafism. And Salafism means violence and death, beheadings, rapes, and live burnings. They encourage it to promote strict adherence to the Quran and Sharia law. ISIS declares jihad, war, submission against infidel Christians, that's us, Jews, that's me, Westerners and Muslims who don't recognize their leader, al-Baghdadi, as caliph. And finally, five, they use social media and social networks to spread propaganda and recruit fighters. So there's a little bit of a short course on who they are and what they do. On to our next slide now. On our next slide, I told you that ISIS, obviously, we've seen their influence here, but ISIS has been uh, coming against Israel fairly recently in the news. This is an ISIS man. You can see the flag behind him at a rally where he said, We shall conquer Jerusalem from you, O Jews. And, and I thought about two things after I read that. I said, you know, Lord, here we go again. Uh, you know, where, where yet someone else wants Israel wiped off the face of the earth. And the second thing I thought of is, okay, we will conquer Jerusalem from you, Jews. Yeah, get in line. People have been saying that for thousands and thousands of years. When are they going to recognize that because God has his hand on the Holy Land, it's just not going to go away? Amen. And maybe, and maybe, and maybe there might just be something really wrong and false about your Allah if after 3,000 years he can't get rid of a piece of land that's smaller than the state of New Jersey. I'm just saying it, so. Let's go on to our next slide. Talking about ISIS. This is a, an ISIS soldier holding a knife in his hands produced a video about three months ago, and he spoke in Hebrew. It was directed toward Israel. He said, we assure you, Israel, that soon there will not be a single Jew left in Jerusalem and through the country. Bring back horror to the Jews with explosive burnings and stabbings. This was posted on social media. Now you know where these stabbings are coming from and why. Because all of a sudden, in the past three, four months, we're hearing like every other day, Palestinians from East Jerusalem going out and stabbing, you know, Jewish people. Where did this come from? Where did they get the idea to do it? Here's the guy. Let's go on to our next slide. And my friends, the, the, it, it, it starts young. Let me give you the background to this. This, 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 just, uh, this tore me up like, like nothing else. Because I told you before, Sandy and I, have three children. And I'm thinking that this, 
this girl is, I don't know, five, six years old or something like that. When, when our daughter Casey was five, six years old, she was, she was going to kindergarten. She was playing with her toys. She was playing with, with friends. You know, daddy would take her outside and we'd go out and we'd play ball or, or something like this. This is what parents do with their children. Because you want to raise them up well. You want them to enjoy everything that life has to offer. And we think naturally that because that's what we do, that the world thinks the same way. But unfortunately, it's not the case. What you have here is, I don't know if you can see it, but in her right hand, she's holding a knife. And her father told her, he said, sweetheart, I want you to hold this knife, and I am going to, to take pictures of you. And, and I want you to tell me with those pictures what you want to do with that knife. And these were her words. I want to stab at you. Five, six years old. So far, 22 Israelis have been killed in stabbing attacks, while 138 Palestinians or Arab citizens of Israel have been killed. We should mourn over all the deaths. Amen. Over all of them. Let's go on. It even goes here into institutes, if you will, of higher learning, and I use that term loosely. And an Islamic university in Gaza. Oh, thank you, brother. I, I wouldn't trip anyway, but thank you so much for that. And an Islamic university in Gaza. <laughs> The Dean of Quranic Studies said the Jews in Palestine today are fair game. Even the women go after them all. On to the next slide now. Here on our next slide, I wanted to show you some uh, uh, shots, some photos of ISIS rallies against Israel in the last couple of years. This one took place in Pakistan in July of 2014. These folks holding up an ISIS flag. What were they demonstrating? They were demonstrating against Israeli military operations in Gaza. Now let me refresh your memory, because here's what happens a lot of time in Israel. It's a Sunday afternoon, let's say, in Israel. And everything is going nice and everything is going wonderful. And then all of a sudden a rocket comes over from the Gaza Strip and kills two or three people. Israel responds by sending a rocket and blowing up a building where the bombs have been kept. No injuries. The world responds by blaming Israel. Now you know how it works. And of course, these folks are blaming Israel because how dare Israel take the opportunity and the right to defend herself. After all, she's an occupying nation. She's occupying Palestinian territory. Oh, don't worry, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But let's go on to our next slide. Here's another ISIS action that took place actually this past July in the Sinai Peninsula, where ISIS inspired groups shot rockets at Israel. Now these rockets, these missiles landed in an empty field. There were no injuries, but the Sinai Peninsula right next to the Israeli border. It's like, it, it, it's, it's, I'll give you an example. This is a perfect area. It's like someone from Blythe was shooting rockets over the Colorado River to here in Ehrenberg. That's how close it can be. It's not that far away. Now, on to our next slide, if you will, please. And on this slide, of course, you'll remember also last year what happened was our administration said, well, we've got to make an agreement with Iran to, to you know, deal with this nuclear weapons situation and we'll let them build up a, a uranium and, and, and everybody should be okay with that. How many of you know Israel is not okay with that? Amen. When Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu found out about it, he said, the world is now in a much more dangerous place today than it was yesterday. In the coming decade, this agreement that our administration made with Iran will reward Iran with hundreds of billions of dollars, which Iran will use for terrorism worldwide and its aggression in the region and its efforts to destroy Israel. How many times in the past have we heard the Prime Minister of, or the President of Iran refer to Israel as a cancer or a tumor that needs to be removed? This is not a country that you reward with the opportunity to enrich uranium, which you know they're going to use for nuclear weapons anyway. Amen. On to our next slide here. ISIS's problem, Israel's ISIS problem, is our problem. We found that out, not just last week with Philadelphia, but my goodness, uh, you know, a whole laundry list. Remember Chattanooga earlier in 2015? Boston, Massachusetts area where a young man who was inspired by ISIS went out with a knife, tried to stab some police officers. Uh, those who attack Israel attack us. 
If we can understand the dangers that face Israel, we can better understand the dangers that face us. So we need to ask a couple of questions. We know now why we should bless Israel. But what we need to know also is why is Israel so hated? Well, let me show you our next slide. Because on our next slide, I want to tell you a little bit about this gentleman. You might know him, you might not. His name is Martin O'Malley. Martin O'Malley is the former governor of Maryland. He's also running on the Democratic ticket for president, along with Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. Now, I'm not going to make this political, but I do want to show you what he said a couple of months ago when he was speaking at an Arab American organizational meeting in Michigan. And this was at the time that the stabbings were going on in Jerusalem. Listen. He said, like everyone here, I've been deeply concerned about the recent developments in Jerusalem and cities across Israel and the West Bank. He said, both sides have to take responsibility or steps to end this violence and address the underlying cause of it. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but the problem that I have with the statement is where he says both sides. In other words... If a Jewish person is walking down the streets of Tel Aviv, minding his own business, and he gets stabbed in the back by a knife from a, uh, a young Palestinian from East Jerusalem, it's not only the Palestinians who have to take steps to end this violence, it's, it's Israel that has to take steps to end it too. In other words, it's Israel's fault as well. Why would it be Israel's fault as well? All we were doing is walking around the street, minding our own business. Why would it be Israel's fault? Because what Mr. O'Malley is essentially saying or inferring is, well, you know, look, if Israel weren't occupying Palestinian ter territory in the first place, then those, those Palestinians wouldn't be upset and they wouldn't be stabbing y'all. You need to get out of Palestinian territory because it's all about occupation. Now, first of all, let me give you a biblical reason why we're not occupying anything. Right. Come on. Go on to our next slide. Israel is occupying Palestinian land, not according to God. Here's what the Lord says. In Genesis 15, 18. Now remember, whether it's three minutes ago or 3,000 years ago, the word stands. Amen. The Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your descendants, I've given this land. And God told them where it is. He said, this land goes from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile, all the way to the great river Euphrates. That's Iraq. How many of you know that's a lot of land? Yeah. How many of you know if God says, Abraham, this land belongs to your people, and, and today Israel is barely like one-sixth of the size of it, then it will occur to me that Israel is not occupying anybody else's land. Everybody else is occupying Israel. Amen. Right. But occupation? Is it all about occupation? You know, we just get out and... and just get out of Palestinian land. There wouldn't be any violence because it's the occupation that's been the cause of the violence. No, it's not. And the Bible and history prove it. And let me show you so that you can prove it too. On to our next slide. Numbers 21, verses 21 through 23 is a great place to start. Now, let me tell you what's going on in this story because it's so great. And it's, it's, so, it's, it's such a Jewish story. It's so typical of Jewish people. Typical of, of, of Jewish people because here's what happened. In the book of Numbers, my people were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Just, just all, Here's the only crime we were committing. We were committing a crime. We were just trying to get home. Wow. We were just trying to get home. That was our only crime. Now, in order to do that, we had to go through other lands and other territories where there were other people who, was, who, who were settling there. So, Moses and Aaron made it a policy to have the Israelites, they said, look, anytime we know that we're going to be going through one of those other tribes' territories, get, let's send messengers in advance. Let's tell them that we're coming so that, number one, they're not surprised, they're not shocked, they don't think we're trying to take over. And we'll just tell them in advance, look, we want to let you know we're here. We're, we're just, what we're just, the reason we're here is we're trying to get home. And we don't mean you any harm, but we need to pass through your land. And listen, we are going to pass through your land. We're not going to steal anything. We're not going to take anything. We're not going to bother anybody. The only reason we're here is because you're, you, you're a point on our destination. We, 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 we don't want any trouble. And we're just giving you the courtesy of letting you know in advance. And that's what Numbers 21, verses 21 through 23 is all about. 
the Israelites are going through some territory that's not their own, and they want to kind of send a message ahead to say, hey, we're coming, but we don't want any trouble. Well, let's see what happened. Israel sent messengers to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, because they were going through where the Amorites were, saying, let us pass through your land. And king, we will not turn aside into field or vineyard. We're not going to pick any fruits and take anything away from you. We, will not, we won't even drink the water from anybody's well. Don't worry about it. We will go by the king's highway, main route, so we won't stray until we pass through your territory. Now, it doesn't seem like a huge request, does it? Apparently, Sihon thought it was. Because King Sihon, it said, would not allow Israel to pass through. And to show how serious he was, listen to what he did. He gathered all his people together in a whole kingdom and went out against Israel to the wilderness and came to Jehaz to fight against Israel. So this man, this king said, I'm going to bring evil and terror and I'm going to bring war against Israel and violence against Israel. What was Israel occupying then to incite that violence and hatred? Answer, nothing. It's not about occupation. But I think we need to more than just one example to make the point, don't you? So let's go on to another one. The book of Esther, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I love the book of Esther. My kids love, love the book of Esther because it's all about the, the festival of Purim. Do you all know the story about the book of Esther? Yeah. The book of Esther is really a really wonderful story. It's about a king whose name you can't pronounce unless you sneeze three times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I'll, I'll do it where it's Ahasuerus. And King Ahasuerus, this, this was a partying king. I mean, this king loved to hold parties and banquets. And, and, and what he also loved to do is, is during the party when he got drunk enough, I'm not kidding, he would send for his wife, Queen Vashti, because she was very, very beautiful. And in fact, it's reported that on one such occasion, he, he said, send my wife in and tell her, that don't put any clothes on. After a while, how many of you know Vashti basically said, okay, this is nonsense, I have enough of this, I'm not coming anymore. Amen. And the king said, well, <laughs> then you're gone, you're out. She was banished from the palace. To which the king said, okay, i got to look for another queen. And so this king, by the way, a Persia pagan king, holds a beauty contest and... Let me tell you how funny God is. I'm so glad we got God with the sense of humor. <laughs> to this pagan king, right? He holds a beauty contest. And, and the woman that he picks <laughs> is Jewish. I love it. you got to love this. I love this. And of all the contests, he picks a Jewish girl. God is so good. Amen. And so her name is Esther, and she's kind of, she's, you know, trying to keep her, her Jewish background from, from the king and from a lot of people because she doesn't want the people to get persecuted. The king also has an assistant, a viceroy by the name of Haman. And Haman's a real bad guy. And Haman, basically, Haman's a, 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 a type of the Antichrist. He really is. Because what Haman wants to do is, is Haman wants to everybody to bow and give him worship. And every time Haman goes out walking around the palace or the kingdom, everybody he requests to bow down to him, and everybody does, almost, because uh, Esther has a, a cousin by the name of, of Mordecai, and Mordecai, he's concerned about his cousin Esther, he doesn't want anything to happen to her, anybody find out that she's Jewish, so Mordecai is constantly hanging around by the palace, which means that one of these days, uh, you know, obviously he would run into Haman, because if Haman's by the palace and Mordecai is over by the palace, well, well, at one point or another, these two guys are going to meet. Amen? Amen? And on one particular day, he did. So Haman's walking around, and this one's bowing down to him. Thank you for bowing down. Thank you for bowing down. And there's Mordecai, and Mordecai's standing up. And, you know, you could just see Haman like, okay, anytime. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> and Mordecai won't bow down. Now, what does Haman do? How does he respond? Well, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet, yeah, yet, yeah, here it comes. Having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Let's destroy the Jews. 
evil persecution against coming against the Jewish people. And what was Israel occupying then? Answer, nothing. There was no Israel back then yet. Here's another example. On our next slide, the Ben Yehuda Street bombing, February 28th, 22nd, 1948. Let me tell you a little bit about this. This took place in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, Israel, where on, on one morning, three British army trucks rolled down Ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem, and at a particular time, they were detonated. They blew up. 58 Israelis were killed. It was February 22nd, 1948. What was Israel occupying then? Answer, nothing. And my friends, look, Israel became a state on May the 14th of 1948. Look at that date. That's February 22nd, 1948. How could anybody accuse Israel of occupying other territory when she wouldn't even become her own state for another 11 weeks? This has never been about occupation. It's an excuse that even the politicians don't get. Let's go on to our next slide. So then, why does the world hate Israel? Well, I, I kind of gave you a little bit of a biblical reason before where we know that Satan, obviously, is working in our midst. But let's be a little bit more specific. Let's go on to our next slide. Here's reason number one. Because uh, Israel's Jewish. Uh, this man that you're looking at, it's a photo of a gentleman by the name of Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah the leader of Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. A couple of years ago, he said this, because you think, well, you know, these Jews have got to get out of Israel. It, it wouldn't be so angry against the Jews if they just, just leave Israel. Well, listen to what he says. If they all gather in Israel, it will save us the trouble of going after them worldwide. That he just wants Jews to die. doesn't matter where they are doesn't sound like having to do anything with occupation because based upon what this guy said he'd go to Greenland to try and find it. Yeah. Ah. Number two. Reason number two because of what's called a leftist mindset. Now this is a pretty complicated quote by Dennis Prager. I'll read you the quote and then I'll simplify it. He says Westerners are almost always wrong when they fight third world countries or groups and the weaker party is almost always deemed the victim when fighting a stronger, especially Western group or country. Leftism has replaced good and evil with rich and poor, strong and weak, and Western or white and non-Western or non-white. Israel is rich, strong, and Western. The Palestinians are poor, weak, and non-Western. In other words, let me explain what this means. That the reason that people hate Israel is because the fact that Israel happens to be stronger than her neighbors is seen as a political disadvantage for her in terms of propaganda. Well, you're stronger. You shouldn't have the opportunity to defend yourselves. That's the mindset. And it's wrong. Anyone who is attacked has the opportunity, should have the opportunity to defend themselves. And guess what? If they win, okay. They shouldn't have been attacked wrongly in the first place. Amen. Next reason, reason number three, because people believe propaganda. Now, I know, I know that people are influenced by the media. And, and I know what the media does because, folks, before I got into ministry, I was the media. I worked in radio and television news. I understand those people and how they think, how I used to think before I got saved. And, and there's just so much propaganda out there, and so people believe it, and they hold protests. Israel murders children. Why does Israel get away with murder? Zionists equal Nazis. Let me show you. Let me show you how anti-Israel the media is. We caught them in the act. On our next slide, let me show you this. This is a, a website banner headline from, I believe, last April, or Time Magazine. And on Time Magazine's website, they were reporting a news story. The banner headline said, Israeli jets launch airstrikes on the Gaza Strip. That's all they said. Now, if you read that, guess what you're going to believe? You're going to say, man, you know those people in Gaza just going around minding their own business one day, and all of a sudden, jets took off from Israel and started bombing them. It, that's terrible. We need to protest against Israel. That's naturally what you should think. But that's not what happened. See, a lot of people saw that headline and they complained. 
And they complained because they said, Time Magazine, they said, you get that off right now. You report this story correctly. Or, 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 or we're going to spread the word on what you're doing. It's a bias. Why don't you tell us, Time Magazine, what happened in order for Israel to do that? You change that banner headline and get it right. And because of pressure, Time Magazine took this off. And let me show you what they put on. So on our next slide. Israel launches airstrikes after... After Gaza militants fire rocket. Wow. Kind of changes the story a little bit now, doesn't it? Yeah. But they never would have put that up if nobody had opened up their mouths. Come on. Let me show you the next slide, the comparison between the two. See, here's the first one, here's the second one. And by the way, you know, this is a magazine that's supposed to be doing journalism. You should have skills in English. Even when they changed it, they still didn't get it right. But I kind of like how they changed it anyway. Because it's not Israel launches airstrikes after Gaza militants fire rockets. It's like, an Israeli launched airstrikes after Gaza militants fire rocket. You know, I read this like, wow, man. You got this one Jewish guy took care of them all. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Now, before we go on to our next slide, talking about propaganda and how people believe the lies, let me set this next slide up for you. Um, last March, I was asked to come and be the keynote speaker at the annual Governor's Prayer Breakfast in Helena, Montana, that was held at Carroll College in Helena. And, and I said, praise the Lord, I'll go up. And so I, I went up to, to Montana. And uh, this was a, an 8 in the morning prayer breakfast at a college in Helena, Montana. And uh, they, they, they had obviously a lot of notable political leaders from, from the state. It was great to meet them all. And uh, we had five, six, seven hundred people there. And so these folks asked me, they said, Rabbi, we want you to come and, and could you please talk about why we as a nation, not just Montana, need to support Israel? And I appreciated that because the really cool thing is, you remember last year when Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu came here to talk to Congress? Yeah. He also spoke to, uh, he had another meeting with like an American Jewish committee, and by name, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu mentioned some states that were on his heart. Montana was one of them. Yeah. And, and so the folks in Montana had me come up. So here's the deal. Here's what happened. So we're getting ready before the breakfast, and all these people are coming in, and I'm trying to greet as many people as possible. And I have a woman that comes over to me as she's coming in. She said, Rabbi Jack, she said, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. She said, I just want to let you know there are protesters outside. <laughs> and I said, really? And she said, yeah. And I said, cool. Because, I mean, look, y'all know me, I'm, I'm, I'm from New York, I'm used to this kind of thing, but I never had people come to protest me before. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, I, to be honest, like, I, I, you know, I felt kind of good about it. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow. I, I, you know, in fact, I got on the phone before the breakfast and I called, I called my wife, Sandy, I said, hey, baby, how you doing? She said, I'm fine. She said, how's everything there? I said, everything's fine. I said, and I, guess what? She said, what? I said, there are people protesting me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of, you know, walking around like this. <laughs> you know, I'm, look, I'm, I'm Jordan and Ryan and Casey's dad. You know, I'm Sandy's husband. I just consider myself a believer in all other protesters. You know, and I'm expecting my wife to say, oh, honey, that's wonderful. But, you know, of course, she said, get out of there now. <laughs> yeah. So... So the woman said to me, she said, there are protesters outside. I said, okay. I said, he said you know, I'm going to go out there, and, and I'm going to go see those protesters. She said, oh, don't do that, Reverend. I said, it's okay. I want to go out. I said, I want to take a picture of these protesters who are outside there waiting to protest me. So I got, you know, I got my phone. I got the camera phone. I'm ready. And I'm walking outside and, and to confront and take a picture of like, this massive, massive group. Protesters. So I want to show you. I took their picture. I want to show you the picture of all of these people who came to protest your rabbi. Ready? Here we go. There they are. Okay, it's a start, okay? 
<laughs> so, so I went over and took their picture. I, I asked if I could take their picture. They said, yes, of course. I'm like, yeah, this is really evil. Okay. <laughs> and, and I took their picture. And so I, I, you know, I looked, obviously, at the guy on the left. I said to him, I said, I said, now, your, your sign says Christ is peace. I said, I want to tell you, I love your sign. Thanks for holding it up. And then I looked at the girl, and the woman, and I saw that she's holding up a sign called Free Palestine. I said, I see your sign says Free Palestine. I said, your sign? I don't love so much. I said, tell me something. Why are you holding up a sign like that? She said, she said, because Israel is occupying Palestinian land. I said, where'd you hear that from? She said, well, I listened to the news. I'm like, oh. I said, okay. Um, I said, uh, tell me something. Uh, do you know, just by any shadow of a doubt, what Genesis 15, 18 says in the Bible? Uh-oh, come on. She said, I don't know. I said, okay. I said, do you know what the six-day war was all about? She said, I don't know. I said, do you know what happened to Israel on May the 14th of 1948? No, I don't know. You ever heard of the Balfour Declaration of 1917? The SS Exodus trying to take port in Haifa in 1947? The Camp David Accords, the Oslo Accords? Is any of this stuff ringing a bell to you at all? She said, I don't know. I said, sweetheart, that's the problem. I said, you're protesting something you don't know about. I said, please do yourself a favor, because you don't want to give an I don't know answer to another guy who, like me who will come up to you in the future. You don't want to look stupid. I don't want you to look stupid. So go do the research. Oh, man. That's right. And after you do the research and look through history and look through the Bible, come on. you won't be holding up a sign. Sure. Isaiah 41.11 told us there would be times like these. All who rage against you, Israel, will be shamed and disgraced. Look what's going to happen to those who come against her. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and they will perish. Mm. You know, yes, we need to pray. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But you know what? We need to pray for those other nations and Amen. enemies around her that they would turn away from their sin. Amen. Because listen, Amen. when you keep coming against Israel, here's the destiny. God's desire is that none should perish, Amen. but that all should have everlasting right. life. Our prayer, Lord, should be, please wake those nations up. But Lord, even though we get angry and upset with them, and in the flesh sometimes we just say, kill them all. As believers, Lord, our prayer should be, Father, take the blindness off their eyes. Amen. So, so that these enemies can become friends. Yeah. So that they can become believers in Jesus. Amen. So that they can stop following this false God, Allah. Amen. And follow the one true God yeah. of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his son, Jesus Amen. Christ. Hallelujah. last slide, I believe. So what do we do now? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. ISIS wants to destroy her. As the return of our Lord looms closer, let us prepare for these difficult times by drawing closer, not closet, to him. <laughs> let us also do all we can in these days to proclaim the truth that there's salvation in no one else, no one other than Jesus the Messiah. And this is true for Jewish people and for people all over the world. Heavenly Father, as we close in prayer, Lord God, let it be our prayer. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful, so thankful for the fact that, that I think I heard these figures, that each week, uh, some 16,000 Muslims a week are coming and asking Christ into their lives. 16,000! And, and Lord, Father, we're asking that you multiply those numbers, Lord of God. We're asking, Father, that all that you speak about in the Bible who will go on bended knee and say, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes, that there would be such an even greater harvest that we could ever imagine. And we thank you for that in Christ Jesus' name. And everyone agreed and said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. I, uh, Brother Ron.
before I but before I uh, uh, finish up, can I pronounce that wonderful blessing that yes. I pronounce over everybody each time I come? All right, good. By the way, um, on the way out, and I'll, I'll meet you over there by the door. If you are not currently receiving materials from Jewish Voice Ministries International, you are breaking the eleventh commandment. We got to take care of that like, quick. I, I, no, I'm sorry, I mean quick because this this is a ministry. We've been around now for fifty years, and this is a ministry that supports Israel. And a ministry that says, we got to bless and, and share the gospel with the Jewish people and the nations, with everybody. Yeah. And uh, I want you to get free materials and mailings and magazines from us. And all you do to get that is just take one of these cards, fill out the front with your name, address, and phone number. Leave the card with me, the bigger part of the card with me. Take the smaller part with you as you go. And uh, I'll make sure that you get on our mailing list. And listen, don't worry about mailing lists. Uh, uh, we, we, we don't stuff your mailbox. The magazines remain free. And as I always say when I come here, no, we don't sell your name to telemarketers. At least not anymore. But anyway. <laughs> so just fill out that card. On the bottom of the card, there are three boxes. One says pray. Another says go. Another says give. That's for our medical missions outreaches. This past year, and, and right now since I've been with Jewish Voice, I've been to Ethiopia six times, India three times, Zimbabwe once. We go to these places and we bring with us people who work in the medical field and also people who don't. Because we need doctors, dentists, eye surgeons to provide free medical care to these people in these lands who come in and they have nothing. And after they get treated, they want to know more about why we're there. And that's why we send them into our prayer room. Where folks like you, if you're not in the medical field, could help us out, pray for their healing, and pray for them to receive Jesus. That's what those boxes are all about. If you want to join us on a medical clinic, check the box. We'll have somebody get in touch with you. If God wants you there, he'll provide the finances for you. So thanks again, by the way, for coming. Amen. Brother Ron, I love you, and I love your church. And, and there's a part of me that wishes I didn't live so far away in Phoenix, because I'm telling you, man, if I were living here, you'd see me here as much as you're here. When I say family, I mean, I mean okay? Let me send you out with this blessing now from the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. It's called the priestly blessing or the Aaronic benediction. I will do it in three languages today. I will say it over you first in English, then I will say it over you in Spanish, and then I will close by singing it over you in the original Hebrew. And so to each and every one of you who's come, and as you go about the day, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord our God lift up his countenance upon you. And may he grant you his peace. El Señor te bendiga y te guarde. El Señor haga resplandecer su rostro sobre ti y tenga de ti misericordia. El Señor alce sobre ti tu rostro y el ponga en ti paz. Sung in the Hebrew. It sounds this way. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh.
God of Israel. He wants to live in your heart. And you can only live in your heart by you accepting Him as Lord and Savior. There might be someone that's here this morning who's never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. You can do that. There are a lot of people that are, are going home, that are going into eternity. You don't want to go into eternity without knowing the Savior. The Savior of Israel. The Savior of the world. The Savior of you today. All it takes is a simple prayer. Let's bow our heads, please. I want you to search your heart. There might be some this morning say, Pastor, I know the Lord, but I haven't been living right. The things that I know that God is not pleased with, I need to surrender them this morning at the foot of the cross. I need to give them to Jesus. There might be someone who said, I never accepted Jesus Christ. I've been to different churches and I, I, I wrote my name on the, on, the, on the line and I've been water baptized. I've taken communion, but I have never accepted Jesus Christ. I am not born again. And I'd like to know him this morning as Savior. If you're that person, without anyone looking around, I'm going to embarrass you. But just lift up your hand. If you're that person this morning who said, I need more of Jesus than I've ever needed before, just lift up your hand. I see hands all over this place. I want everyone standing now. Praise the Lord. Just as I am. And if you raise your hand, I want you to come down to this altar. We're going to pray with you. Not embarrass you, but pray with you. Just as I am. Thy precious blood was shed for me. Oh, Lord, just move this blood. Oh, Lamb of God, oh, Lamb of God. I the sound of my voice, God, is dealing with your heart. You, you used to know him. You, you had an intimate relationship with him. But you're not praying anymore. You're not, you're not doing your Bible study. You're not even going to the house of God. And this is not to condemn you. Because he didn't come to condemn. He came to save. He came to change hearts. He came to make you in the image of his dear son. To take you from glory to glory. To take you to those mountains and those valleys. That he might be glorified in your life. We're going to say that prayer. And it's not what you say, but meeting it from your heart. But let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I come to you, I come to you in, the name of Jesus. in the name of Jesus. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for, my sin. for my sin. The things I've done, the things I've done in, the life I've lived. in the life I've lived. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. With my mouth, With my mouth I confess. I confess. The Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus. The God of Israel. The God of Israel. My Savior. My Savior. And my Redeemer. And my Redeemer. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Come into my life. And be Lord of my life. And be Lord of my life. Wash me. Wash me. In your precious blood. In your precious blood. Thank you now. Thank you now. For cleansing me. For cleansing me. For washing me. For washing me. For sanctifying me. For sanctifying me. And justifying me. And justifying me. Right now. Right now, by simple faith, by simple faith, in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, and what He's done, and what He's done for me, for me, at the cross, at the cross, I am saved, I am saved, I am forgiven, I am forgiven, and I am forever, and I am forever, a child of God, a child of God. In Jesus' name, I pray. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord. A I'm just a nobody. Trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody.